Hey folks, Mark Levin here. Now, before we dive in today's episode, I want to talk about something truly valuable, protecting your financial future with gold. It's called diversification. Now for that, I only trust Advantage Gold. They're the real deal with five-star service and a sterling reputation. So give them a call today. Call Advantage Gold at 800-900-8000. Tell them Mark Levin sent you. Trust me, you'll thank yourself in the future. Now let's get to the show. Results may vary. Consult with your financial professional. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Mark Levin here, our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. Well, it's an important day, 80th anniversary of D-Day, turn the war around in Europe, if we had failed on D-Day, the Allies may well have lost World War II, certainly in the European theater, as our forces were also fighting in the Pacific. A horrendous war. And we hear the, the drums of war now. We're directly being threatened by communist China. They're making threats by fascistic Russia, by the Islamo-Nazi regime in Iran, which was not mentioned in President Biden's speech. If you're going to mention Russia, why would you leave out the rest of the Axis powers? Now, I will get into that. I will get into that a little later. But first, just a little lesson about the D-Day invasion. Cut one, go. Well, D-Day was a, obviously the most important single fight of that war and of course had we lost it there's no telling what the outcome would have been since the american entry into the war american generals had been agitating for an opportunity to fight the germans directly the d-day invasion invasion of normandy in june 1944 represented the cutting edge of this offensive. Essential condition that underwrote the success of D-Day was the fact that Germany had been bled virtually to death by fighting on the Eastern Front uh, for several years against the Red Army and the Soviet Union before D-Day ever happened. The Germans had been preparing for this invasion as long as the Americans and the British had been, and they had been digging in, and they knew that they could inflict appalling casualties on the first units ashore. Well, somebody had to do it. And so the soldiers went, and indeed, those first units did suffer very high rates of death and wounding. There's one thing to go on a beach with fan dunes. It's something else when you've got enemy on top of these bluffs. And for some 
reason, our naval gunnery was either off or something went wrong there. They couldn't destroy those gun emplacements. But eventually, the weight of the invasion took hold. The numbers of Americans, the numbers of craft, allowed the Americans and the British to establish a beachhead. And once they established a beachhead, then they could bring more and more soldiers and equipment ashore. One thing I don't think either the Japanese or the Germans really counted on was what it meant to come up against a massive capitalist industrial power. The ability to build stuff on a massive scale with massive numbers was just something they hadn't really anticipated. If you look back at the old photographs and the footage of that armada out there off the coast of the world, I don't think they've ever assembled before or after anything like that. Eventually, it was the technology, it was the weight of American weapons that tipped the balance. But at the very beginning, it was the soldiers, the ones who splashed ashore, the ones who knew that in the first wave, lots and lots of them would never come back. And those are the ones who made possible everything that followed. The rangers who went in first and the waves that came after them stood right up to it. There was more bravery that day than one can hardly imagine. So many of these battles in World War II were horrendous. Battle of the Bulge, other battles, Iwo Jima. And we can go on and on, but this, this battle was the largest armada in the history of the world. And... Um, I have to say that if you were storming those beaches when they were firing those massive machine guns down on the beaches, when the doors on those boats flopped down, they were they were killing. They were killing our Marines right there, many of them before they got out of the boat. And the rounds were so large they could go through one, two, even three men at a time. Theodore Roosevelt's son, Teddy Jr., was a sergeant. He was an older guy. I think he was in his 50s. He died at Normandy on Omaha Beach, and so did many others, of course. You know, uh, people just, after the attack on Pearl Harbor of all ages, they rushed in to sign up for the various military services. Hundreds of thousands of them. My mother's father, my grandfather, his brother, excuse me, his brother-in-law, and my father. Father was 17, my grandfather was 34. But there's so many stories. Harold Hal Baumgarten, a D-Day veteran whose recollections inspired the opening scenes of Saving Private Ryan. Recall saying the Shema, one of the most important prayers in the Jewish faith, in the Hebrew, out loud while storming Omaha Beach. Cut 22, go. I decided to draw a huge star of David on the back of my army field jacket. I rode the Bronx, New York around the Star of David. I had to let the uh, Germans know where I was coming from. My fellow soldiers couldn't believe that I was gonna do that. Guys in the outfit said, the Germans are going to cut your so-and-sos off when they see that. We landed about 6.40, not on Ma Beach. Everybody in that boat was killed except for two of us. About 30 of our guys were hiding behind two tanks to survive. I decided, being Jewish, I better go straight in. I didn't want to look like a coward. I wanted the fellas to see that I was didn't have the fear. I'm not going to take cover. I prayed to Shema during that day. 
Adlan. Shema Yisrael Adonai. Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the word of God. The word is one. That was the only prayer I said on the beach. It was, it was a horrible day. It was the, the, long, the longest day. You're lucky you to live through all that. But I did get wounded five times. So many stories. So many men gone. We're going to spend a little time on this, but before we take our first break, Ronald Reagan in Normandy, France, June 6, 1984, the 40th anniversary of D-Day. Hat tip Reagan Foundation. And at the opening, hat tip history. Cut to go. Forty summers have passed since the battle that you fought here. You were young the day you took these cliffs. Some of you were hardly more than boys with the deepest joys of life before you. Yet you risked everything here. Why? Why did you do it? Well, what impelled you to put aside the instinct for self-preservation and risk your lives to take these cliffs? What inspired all the men of the armies that met here? We look at you and somehow we know the answer. It was faith and belief. It was loyalty and love. The men of Normandy had faith that what they were doing was right. Faith that they fought for all humanity. Faith that a just God would grant them mercy on this beachhead or on the next. It was the deep knowledge, and pray God we have not lost it, that there is a profound moral difference between the use of force for liberation and the use of force for conquest. You were here to liberate, not to conquer, and so you and those others did not doubt your cause, and you were right not to doubt. You all knew that some things are worth dying for. One's country is worth dying for, And democracy is worth dying for because it's the most deeply honorable form of government ever devised by man. All of you loved liberty. All of you were willing to fight tyranny. And you knew the people of your countries were behind you. The Americans who fought here that morning knew word of the invasion was spreading through the darkness back home. They fought or felt in their hearts, though they couldn't know in fact... That in Georgia, they were filling the churches at 4 a.m. In Kansas, they were kneeling on their porches and praying. And in Philadelphia, they were ringing the Liberty Bell. Something else helped the men of D-Day. Their rock-hard belief that Providence would have a great hand in the events that would unfold here. That God was an ally in this great cause. And so the night before the invasion... When Colonel Wolverton asked his parachute troops to kneel with him in prayer, he told them, do not bow your heads, but look up so you can see God and ask his blessing in what we are about to do. Also that night, General Matthew Ridgway on his cot, listening in the darkness for the promise God made to Joshua, I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. These are the things that impelled them. These are the things that shaped the unity of the Allies. When the war was over, there were lives to be rebuilt and governments to be returned to the people. There were nations to be reborn. Above all, there was a new peace to be assured. These were huge and daunting tasks, but the Allies summoned strength from the faith, belief, loyalty, and love of those who fell here. They rebuilt a new Europe together. There was first a great reconciliation among those who had been enemies, all of whom had suffered so greatly. The United States did its part, creating the Marshall Plan to help rebuild our allies and our former enemies. The Marshall Plan led to the Atlantic Alliance, a great alliance that serves to this day as our shield for freedom, for prosperity, and for peace. In spite of our great efforts and successes, not all that followed the end of the war was happier planned. Some liberated countries were lost. 
The great sadness of this loss echoes down to our own time in the streets of Warsaw, Prague, and East Berlin. The Soviet troops that came to the center of this continent did not leave when peace came. They're still there, uninvited, unwanted, unyielding, almost 40 years after the war. Because of this, Allied forces still stand on this continent. Today, as 40 years ago, our armies are here for only one purpose, to protect and defend democracy. The only territories we hold are memorials like this one and graveyards where our heroes rest. We in America have learned bitter lessons from two world wars. It is better to be here ready to protect the peace than to take blind shelter across the sea, rushing to respond only after freedom is lost. We've learned that isolationism never was and never will be an acceptable response to tyrannical governments with an expansionist intent. But we try always to be prepared for peace, prepared to deter aggression, prepared to negotiate the reduction of arms, and yes, prepared to reach out again in the spirit of reconciliation. In truth, there is no reconciliation we would welcome more than a reconciliation with the Soviet Union, so together we can listen, lessen the risks of war now and forever. And Reagan would put in place policies, economic, geopolitical, military, that in the end would destroy the Soviet Union. When we come back, ladies and gentlemen, Donald Trump at the 75th anniversary, and then we'll talk about what Biden had to say. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. You know, folks, China, Russia, Iran, they're all on the move. Right here in the U.S., you've got inflation, you have open borders, and of course, an election year. Oh, we just crossed over $34 trillion in debt with no signs of slowing down. It's time to wake up, folks. There's a lot at risk, possibly even your retirement account. The time to protect yourself is before a crisis, not after. Advantage Gold, the gold and silver company I recommend to help Americans. Well, they'll help you prepare now for times just like these. Call them at 800 900 8,000 today. Get their free 2024 gold and silver kit. Plus, tell them I sent you and they'll give you a special Mark Levin discount worth up to $1,300 if you qualify. Call Advantage Gold today. Here's the number. 800 900 8,000. Plus, see if you qualify to get your special discount worth up to $1,300 today. 800 900 8,000. Performance may vary. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. You should always consult your financial and tax professional. Very short segment here, and I'll expand on everything after the bottom of the hour, but let me make a point. I went back and listened to the entirety of Reagan's speech. I went back and listened to the entirety of the Trump speech. I listened to the entirety of Biden's speech. Reagan and Trump, when talking about World War II, also mentioned the six million Jews and the liberation of the concentration camps. Joe Biden, with Israel facing down a massive assault, terrorists surrounded by these countries in the middle of a war, where many of those surviving Jews found freedom and security in Israel, didn't say a word. He talked about Ukraine, and I'll get to that in the next day of her, but not a word. Why? Why did Reagan mention it? Why did Trump mention it? And why did Biden ignore what's actually taking place in Israel today? You know, folks, we've got an awful lot swirling around this country, both internally and externally. We've got wars going on in all parts of the world. We've got riots effectively going on in our colleges and universities. We have inflation through the roof. It's an election year to boot. All these problems are often huge tailwinds for gold, which is why gold is at all-time highs, looking like it's going to go higher. And when it comes to gold, I only trust my friends at Advantage Gold. They help Americans just like you protect your retirement accounts and help safeguard 
safeguard your wealth through diversification. So call them right now. 800-900-8000. Get their free 2024 gold and silver kit plus a special Mark Levin discount worth up to $1,300 if you qualify. Call Advantage Gold right now. 800-900-8000. See if you qualify to get your special Mark Levin discount worth up to $1,300 today. Performance may vary. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. You should always consult your financial and tax professional. He's driving the media mad. Mark Levin, call in with your outrage. 877-381-3811. President Trump, 75th commemoration, D-Day, June 6, 2019. Cut three, go. They battled not for control and domination, but for liberty, democracy, and self-rule. They pressed on for love and home and country, the main streets, the schoolyards, the churches, and neighbors, the families, and communities that gave us men such as these. They were sustained by the confidence that America can do anything because we are a noble nation with a virtuous people praying to a righteous God. The exceptional might came from a truly exceptional spirit. The abundance of courage came from an abundance of faith. The great deeds of an army came from the great depths of their love. As they confronted their fate, the Americans of the Allies placed themselves into the palm of God's hand. The men behind me will tell you that they are just the lucky ones. As one of them recently put it, all the heroes are buried here. But we know what these men did. We knew how brave they were. They came here and saved freedom. And then they went home and showed us all what freedom is all about. The American sons and daughters who saw us to victory were no less extraordinary in peace. They built families, they built industries, they built a national culture that inspired the entire world. In the decades that followed, America defeated communism, secured civil rights, revolutionized science, launched a man to the moon, and then kept on pushing to new frontiers. And today, America is stronger than ever before. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, ladies and gentlemen, as I listened to Reagan and Trump, there wasn't any politics, any partisanship, any innuendos, any cheap shots. Republicans, Democrats, non-affiliated, could all embrace it. It was about America, not America's political parties or political differences. And so while some good things were said today by Biden, he does not deserve the accolades that most people are giving. I watched it. I listened to it. So did others, like Christian Tatak the Washington Examiner. Biden uses D-Day speech to take veiled shots at Trump. Vows to stand by Ukraine. Biden delivered remarks commemorating the 80th anniversary of D-Day in Normandy, France, vowing to continue standing alongside the people of Ukraine. And I'll stop right there. The problem is, ladies and gentlemen, is retired four-star General Jack Keene has said several times now on Fox. They're trying to run a war. Ukraine's defense against Putin. 
and the fascists out of the White House. What kind of weapons they can use, how they can use the weapons, what kind of weapons they must not use. And they're putting their foot down with Europe, too. It's always too little, too late. We've poured tens of billions of dollars into Ukraine. But you can't blame Ukraine when it's, it's not aimed at providing them effectively with weapons to take on the Russian army. I'm not talking about to destroy Russia, although I wouldn't have a problem with that. But that's not the point. The point is you can't fight a purely defensive war. It's not possible. And so while he can talk about Ukraine, the Ukrainians are the first to tell you that Biden has tied their hands. The Israelis are the first to tell you that Biden has tied their hands. And American soldiers are the first to tell you that Biden is tying their hands too by destroying the culture in the military. You can see our recruitment numbers are way down. And by starving the military. Our Navy is way below the number of ships it needs. Our Air Force is way below the number of pilots it needs. The Marines are as small as they've been in God knows how many decades, and I could go on and on and on. Not so with the Communist Chinese, the fascistic Russians. Not so with the Islamo-Nazi regime in Iran. And the slave state that's North Korea, that's the access. That's the new access powers. They're all building up. They're all muscling up, in part due to Biden funding Iran. So to give a speech about democracy and to talk about isolationism. It is very troubling to me that his actions never match his words. They go on in the Washington Examiner. Biden's remarks honoring the veterans cautioned against allowing tyranny and dictators to go unchecked across the free world and bore more than a passing resemblance to comments the president frequently makes on the 2024 campaign trail about his likely opponent, former President Donald Trump. And I am noticing that in the editing, as they play comments by Biden, they're editing all this out. They're editing all this out. The president often criticizes Trump for his isolationist foreign policy, attacks his friendships with Putin and Un, routinely claims that Trump would be a dictator on day one if elected to a second term. Biden said isolation wasn't the answer 80 years ago, and it's not the answer today. To surrender to bullies, to bow down to dictators is simply unthinkable. Were we to do that, it means we would be forgetting what happened here on these hollowed beaches. Make no mistake. We will not bow down, and we will not forget. So why are you funding Iran? Why are you kowtowing to communist China? Why are you preventing the Ukrainians from winning? And why didn't you mention the righteous war that Israel is fighting for its survival? At all. Is that not democracy against tyranny? Biden also frequently mentions an unverified claim that Trump referred to World War II veterans as suckers and losers while visiting Normandy as president. Trump never referred to suckers and losers. That's just one of those lies that turns into myths that apparently you cannot kill. It's like a bad cockroach. And he closed his Thursday speech by honoring the D-Day Armed Forces as heroes. Which, of course, they are. Of course they are. So that speech had significant political overtones. It was not the speech that a world leader or statesman gives. I don't go along with the crowd. We wanted it to be a great speech. We wanted to unite around what was taking place, the 80th anniversary of D-Day. But I'm not going to ignore what's taking place. I want to remind you of something. 
This is the same president a week or two ago that was at Morgan State, a historically black college, and a men's college. And he got up front of the graduating class. These young men who work very hard to get there, very hard to get through their studies, they're part of the United States of America. They're leaders, future leaders in the United States of America. In any field they want to lead in. They did what Americans do, of all stripes. And he got up there and he railed against his country. He railed against America. He basically told these graduates, you don't have a chance. America is systemically racist. It is systemically unequal. He did the same thing when he spoke at Howard University. He did the same thing when he spoke to the Sharpton's group. I can't think of a speech he's given in this country that has been inspiring and patriotic, that has made the American people feel positive about themselves, positive about their history. I can't think of one. Can you? He gets in front of Independence Hall, where I've been a hundred times and more. Sacred ground, in my view. Gives one of the most horrendous, hateful speeches any president has ever given. Those men who died on D-Day, and died after D-Day, and died before D-Day, and are dying now in some hell hole, some corner of the world. They're not fighting for a racist America. They're not fighting for inequality. They're not fighting for imperialism and colonialism. They're not fighting for the 1619 project as opposed to 1776. They're not fighting so the American flag could be pulled down for the Palestinian flag. They're not fighting so the border's open, so Venezuelan gangs can come in here, attack, shoot cops, so women could be raped on the border, children sold into pornography. They're not fighting for any of that. They're patriots. It's a volunteer military. They don't have to be there. They haven't been drafted. It is hard for me to put behind the things that Joe Biden has said about this country and says about it over and over again, trying to turn American against American. It's very difficult for me to tolerate this. And this from the man, when he set foot in the Senate, threw in with the racists and the segregationists. With four racists and segregationists in particular, two from Mississippi, one from Georgia, one from West Virginia, all of whom had been backed by the local Klan, one of whom started the local Klan. And he goes to these colleges and universities, these historically black colleges, and he attacks his country. And there he is on D-Day, saying many important significant things, but laced with the real Joe Biden. This is a nasty dude. That was not the place to take shots. As for isolationism, I take a backseat to nobody on isolationism. But it is Joe Biden who's withholding arms from Israel and telling Israel that not only can it defeat Hamas, but Hezbollah that is shooting rockets in the Israel in God knows how many quantities, attacking their towns, starting forest fires. There's a war going on, and Israel was warned today not to react. Can you imagine Joe Biden as President of the United States when we were struck at Pearl Harbor? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to tell you this. As a grandson of a warrior, as the great nephew of a warrior, as the son of a warrior, I don't have to pretend. I don't have to play along, and I'm not going to. 
I wished that he would have give, given an inspiring, searing speech. But he did not. 10, 20, 30 years from now, nobody's going to play that speech as an inspiration for the American people. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. All over the world, our enemies are on the move. And in our own country, same thing. Things are tough between rising prices, election issues, a $34 trillion debt. But folks, there is good news. If you're smart, you can use these problems to your advantage. By making the right choices right now, you can keep your retirement money safe and even make more money in this climate. That's where Advantage Gold comes in. They're experts in helping Americans protect their savings with gold and silver. It's called diversification. Call Advantage Gold today, 800 They'll send you a free 2024 gold and silver kit that tells you how to keep your money safe when things are bad. Tell them I sent you, and you may qualify for a special Mark Levin discount worth up to $1,300. Call Advantage Gold at 800-900-8000. 800-900-8000. See if you qualify for that special discount worth up to $1,300. That's 800-900-8000. Performance may vary. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. You should always consult your financial and tax professionals. By the way, I'm not trashing Biden. He's trashing us, okay? He can't help it. This is, this is how he has always been his entire life. He's an attack dog. He's done it to many great men and women throughout his career, throughout his life. Some of the most brilliant lawyers and judicial minds in the nation to prime ministers of Israel... He does it all the time. He is who he is. He attacked integration, which means he didn't support Brown versus Board. He gives these horrendous speeches, trashing the country, trying to fire up people, one against the other. He has sat on his hands with rampant anti-Semitism going on throughout the United States. And his biggest enemy overseas is not Putin. It's not On. It's not Khomeini. It's not G. It's Netanyahu. Because he's desperate for the river to the sea crowd vote in Michigan and these other places. That's the truth. As for democracy, trying to put your opponent in prison, that doesn't strike me as very small d democratic. Does it you? Violating our immigration laws in violation of the Constitution's take care clause, that doesn't seem very democratic to me, does it to you? No, not really. Defying two Supreme Court decisions, well, that doesn't seem very democratic to me. And I can go on and on and on. So I'm not going to sit here like a clapping seal and go along with this. I'm not the one being negative. I'm the one explaining what this man is doing. He's the most powerful man in the United States. I'm just one guy behind a microphone. As we would say in South Philly, there you be. There you are, Mr. Producer. Hey, by the way, Mr. Producer, how are your Mets doing? How come you don't ask me how my Phillies are doing? Great. Fantastic. Super duper. I'll be right back. This segment of the podcast is exclusively sponsored by Pure Talk. Pure Talk offers great coverage and can save your family money on your wireless bill every single month. Go to puretalk.com to find the plan that's right for you. Thank you again for listening, and thank you so much for this sponsorship, Pure Talk. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. Boy, do we have a killer life, liberty, and Levin on Saturday. Two great guests after my... It'll be very different, my opening statement this time. Very different. I hope you'll check it out. Um, we have Elise Stefanik 
and we have Professor Stephen Calabrese, uh, two superstars in their field. And Calabrese is one of the lawyers, legal professor, who was involved in the filing challenging the appointment of Jack Smith. And he will elucidate on that in representing former Attorney General Misa Mukasey, as you know, Landmark Legal Foundation, of which I am chairman, fantastic president and staff there. Uh, they filed as well. And so both will be providing o- oral arguments uh, towards the end of this month. So I wanted you to hear about that. And, of course, Elise Stefanik. She's t- terrific. And Sunday, we've got Governor Ron DeSantis, America's governor out of Florida. He's fantastic. And America's wise man, Victor Davis Hanson, to help us put it all together. Again, as well as my opening statement, I encourage you, all the Levinites out there, set your DVRs. Seriously. Maybe you won't be home. Maybe something will come up. Maybe you want to watch something else. I encourage you strongly. Just set your DVRs for 8 p.m. Eastern Time, whatever time that is in your area, for Saturdays and Sundays. That's what we do with shows that we want to watch, just in case we're not around or out to dinner or something like that. So I want to encourage you to do that as well. Set your DVRs, because I want you to see these, these guests. I want you to hear what they have to say, because we're only on twice a week, not five times a week plus weekends or whatever everybody's doing. So uh, we do things a little differently as well in terms of the format of the program. Others are great too, but we do our thing. 8 p.m. Eastern Time, Saturday and Sunday. Just go ahead and set your DVR, in my humble opinion. Well, D-Day. And so tomorrow it won't be D-Day. And tomorrow, what will they say about our military? Tomorrow, what will they do to support our military? I think that's a fair question. I think it's an important question. Ronald Scharf is a World War II vet who stormed Omaha Beach in Normandy. And he was interviewed by Martha McCollum, who deserves all the credit in the world. She is fantastic. She's a real journalist. She's a patriot. There she is in Normandy. She cares very, very much about these veterans, and you can see it and feel it. And I happen to know she's a very lovely person. And she's interviewing Ronald Scharf. And let's listen to that. Cut nine, go. When you're here with all of these brothers and people who experienced the war as you did, and also um, the subsequent wars in Korea and Vietnam, what do you think about the state of our country today? How do you feel about the the country that you worked so hard to to stay free, to keep free? The real truth? Yeah. I I feel like a foreigner in my own country lots of times, and I I don't like it. It makes my heart real heavy. And... uh, I just hope we can pull out of this. There's too much, too much Hollywood going on in Washington all the time. The important subjects they don't cover. So the thing is, I I hope that uh, I hope all the guys will rally up and we'll go back and straighten it all out. Mm-hmm. Good Lord, these men are from a different time when we had such pride and patriotism. Throughout the country, now I would say maybe it's half the country, to be perfectly honest with you. It's half the country that see what's happening. Like Mr. Scharf. And the other half are on the attack. Cut 10, go. Do you think 16-year-olds would would fake their age, as you did, in order to go off and fight for the country today, 16-year-olds today? No, I don't think so. It it was a different generation. Each generation is a little bit different. And I I think that all the generations are great, but I think some of the ones they got now are a little lazy. And I I think they got to show more pride in their country than they do 
I, I don't, I don't, I don't like to see that. We're going to take a flag and put a drape it around them or uh, put it on top of a jeep or something like that. You got to respect your flag. That's your country. And uh, I, I'm just hoping I never run into anything where somebody's trying to burn the flag. Because I'll stop them right now. See that? See that? I've always said, Mr. Producer, I'm in the wrong generation. I'm in the right place, but the wrong time. I really believe this. I really feel like I should have been around the founding of the country. That's where my heart is. It really is. I live through these documents. I live through the founders and the framers. Founding a brand new country with all the hope, excitement that's involved in that when you're founding the most enlightened type of government mankind has ever known. Today we're trying to defend what's left of it. You know, once liberty is lost, once liberty is lost, you can't get it back. Maybe in little pieces, but it's never the same. I'm just being honest with you. It's never the same. Every time our bureaucracy issues a regulation or Joe Biden signs an executive order or some activist Democrat judge issues an opinion, Every time Congress meets, especially when the Democrats are in charge, but even when they're not. Rather than advancing the cause of liberty, we lose a little bit of our liberty. In some cases, we lose a lot of our liberty. And it's happening more and more. The bigger the bureaucracy gets, the more aggressive this president gets, the more radicalized the Democrat Party becomes and their media it becomes much, much more difficult to preserve liberty because you're on the defense. And we don't control the culture. And we don't control the bureaucracy. And we don't get a fair shake in the media. It's the truth. And this is what this gentleman is saying in in so many words. And he's not alone. My father thought this way. My mother thought this way. Great patriots. But we all see it. We see it in the way this election is being interfered with through a legal system that looks more like the old Soviet Union, Stalinist in so many respects, while Joe Biden saying he wants to take on Russia. He's exactly the wrong guy to do it. He's more Putin than he is an American president. The way he talks, the way he speaks to tens of millions of Americans. You'll see Saturday on Life, Liberty, and Levin a photo that I found a few years ago. Probably a copy of a photo. Of the 13th platoon. I don't know what regiment. But ultimately, part of the Marine 5th Division. You're going to see a photo of these men. And when you watch the show and you look at that photo, the vast majority of the men in that photo, if I had to guess about 150, 200 of them, I didn't take the time to count. Died at Iwo Jima. The vast majority died fighting on Iwo Jima. Well over 6,000 men lost their lives on Iwo Jima. Almost 20,000 other casualties. 
on this volcanic ash island. The Japanese were dug in despite the bombardment that took place on Iwo Jima. And they fought to the death. And they did not take prisoners alive. They either killed them on the spot or they tortured them at night so the other Marines could hear the screams. They butchered them. The Japanese wouldn't surrender. And when they pretended to surrender, they were really on suicide missions. Over Iwo Jima and the other islands, Japanese fighter pilots would fly their planes so their propellers would shred the American parachuters. This is a war to the end. To the end. Our media and our president at the time, Franklin Roosevelt, they weren't counting how many civilian Japanese were dying while we were fighting for our survival. This much I know. I've looked. There's no accounting of it in real time. People try to put the numbers together after the fact, but during the course of the war, absolutely not. And he fought, did Mo Rubin, his real name was Maurice, he hated it. Before the Battle of Iwo Jima, he was in the Battle of Guam. And his brother-in-law was on the Solomon Islands, the Battle of Guadalcanal. I don't remember them being white supremacists. My grandfather was Jewish. My great-uncle was Gentile. A Christian. I don't remember them having a racist bone in their body. I really don't. I've told you the story of my father. Joe Biden doesn't have any good stories to tell about his father. He was raised differently. I was raised to be a moral human being, to be ethical, to be respectful, and by God, defend your country and the symbols of your country. And thank God you're born in this country, particularly as a Jew. Because there was no other place on the face of the earth that was safe. And that was thanks to the Christian majority. That's what my parents told me. And they were right. My father after World War II. He marries the love of his life, who he met. And they were married till they died, four months apart, five years ago. And what I remember my father telling us is that when he took a train He was born in one of the poorest areas of Philadelphia. But when he took a train, when he was a young man, from the outskirts of Philadelphia, he took it to Washington, D.C. in the late 1940s. When he saw at the train station in Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, 
a water fountain that said whites only. A men's room that said whites only. He was stunned. And disgusted. And he wasn't alone. He wasn't alone. The men who fought in the Civil War. The men who fought in World War I and World War II. These weren't white supremacists. As a matter of fact, people fighting right next to them were white and black, Jew and Gentile. My father always despised Biden. He said, this guy's no damn good. He said, he's a bigot. He's a demagogue. He doesn't mean a damn thing he says. He was right. 100% right. The things Biden says about this country are horrendous. Reminds me of Obama. I understand everybody hasn't served. I didn't serve. But I love my country. Trump didn't serve, but he loves his country. But if you haven't served and you're president and you attack this country, you're a real low life. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Did you know one of the largest U.S. flags in the state of Georgia stands proudly in Pure Talk's parking lot? To honor that flag, Pure Talk is supporting America's warrior partnership in their mission to prevent veteran suicide. For our servicemen and women, the transition to civilian life can be very difficult, especially now. Access to housing, employment, and even their earned VA benefits can be very difficult. That's where America Warriors Partnership steps in by providing real support where and when our vets need it most. And you can help this noble cause when you switch to Pure Talk's 5G service and support this great charity. Through Flag Day, they'll match every dollar donated up to $50,000. Choose a wireless company that shares your values and puts you on America's most dependable 5G network for just $20 a month. Go to puretalk.com. Slash Levin. That's puretalk.com slash L E V I N to make the switch. That's puretalk.com slash Levin for superior cell phone service. That's half the price of Verizon, ATT, or T Mobile, and to help Pure Talk with vets in need. Biden talks about isolationism. How about appeasement? Barack Ravid, who's a self hater, so called reporter, When the Biden administration burps, um, he's there to catch it. He says the Biden administration has cautioned Israel in recent weeks against the notion of a limited war in Lebanon and warned it could push Iran to intervene to U.S. officials. And one Israeli official told me, of course they did. He's the go-to guy for the enemy, in my humble opinion. Former ambassador to Israel from the United States, great man David Friedman, he says, nobody wants a full-on war in Lebanon. The consequences will be devastating for Hezbollah and the Lebanese and potentially Israel. But the attacks against Israel must stop. The 80,000 residents evacuated from northern Israel must be able to return. This is a time for America to project its strength within the region and impose powerful pressure upon Hezbollah in Iran. Don't warn Israel not to attack. It's getting bombarded every day. Instead, place the pressure where it belongs on the enemies of the American people in Israel. So far, Biden does not. Did you know one of the largest U.S. flags in the state of Georgia stands proudly in Pure Talk's parking lot? To honor that flag, Pure Talk is supporting America's warrior partnership in their mission to prevent veteran suicide. For our servicemen and women, the transition to civilian life can be very difficult, especially now. Access to housing, employment, and even their earned VA benefits can be very difficult. That's where America Warriors Partnership steps in by providing real support where and when our vets need it most. And you can help this noble cause when you switch to Pure Talk's 5G service and support this great charity. 
through Flag Day. They'll match every dollar donated up to $50,000. Choose a wireless company that shares your values and puts you on America's most dependable 5G network for just $20 a month. Go to puretalk.com slash Levin. That's puretalk.com slash L-E-V-I-N to make the switch. That's puretalk.com slash Levin for superior cell phone service. That's half the price of Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile. And to help Pure Talk with vets in need. Mark Levin, the great one. The great one, Mark Levin. Dial in now, 877-381-3811. Boy, this show's flying by. And by the way, I don't believe Hunter Biden has a good substantive case for appeal. I agree uh, that we have some excellent Supreme Court decisions on the Second Amendment. But uh, I don't think they have anything to do with somebody who is a drunk or a drug addict, uh, who is impaired, um, going into a gun shop and checking a box, basically saying he's not a drug addict. That's perjury. That's the way it is. It's under the penalty of perjury. I know I've signed that form six times, maybe seven lost count so this is the problem I was explaining on uh, Larry Kudlow's show Fox Business Channel those of us who are law abiding gun owners not drug addicts who fill out these these damnable forms when some nut job, whether they're a druggie, whether they're selling drug, whatever they are, shoot somebody, we're the ones they try to punish. Prosecutors need to enforce these laws. Force the laws that are on the books. We don't need more laws. And I hear prosecutors on TV saying I would never have prosecuted this. That's part of the problem. That's part of the problem. Or that if you purchase a gun from a friend... Or family member, you don't have to fill out any form. That's correct. But the exceptions don't make the rule. Anybody with two pieces of brain tissue rubbed together know that. The reason why that's not part of the reporting process, but the Democrats are desperate to make it part of the reporting process, is so a father can give a gun to a child. Or something like that. Without having to go to the federal government to get permission. That seems like a pretty good reason not to require it, doesn't it, Mr. Producer? That's not the problem in the streets. The problem in the streets is criminals getting guns. Or the drug cartels and the communist Chinese pushing guns across the border. It's not law-abiding citizens. When I was a prosecutor, I wouldn't have prosecuted that case. That's the problem. Hunter Biden lied. Now, if he's not going to be prosecuted, why have the form at all? As for an appeal, I deal with appeals. Federal appeals. I deal with Supreme Court issues, too. It doesn't have a strong case. Well, the Second Amendment is absolute. But it's not. We wish it were, but it's not. You have age requirements. You have all kinds of stuff going on out there. I'm not talking about what we want, what we wish. I'm talking about what is. What is? What if that gun was used in another crime? They'd be running around. The CDC should have a regular... CDC has nothing to do with it. Well, Joe Biden's constantly attacking guns. Not crime, guns. Look at this low-life sleazy son. That's what he is. A low-life... Sleazeball. With the women. With the crack. With the lying. 
with the shaking down of enemy foreign governments by using his name? Everybody knows this is what took place. We have to pretend it didn't. I don't care what all the rest of them have to say. It is what it is. But we're going to make an exception for him on appeal. Appeal, he's got a strong case. He doesn't have a strong case, in my humble opinion. And yes, it should have been prosecuted. Because otherwise, the rest of us pay the price. The rest of us pay the price. I'm shocked to hear this, aren't you, Mr. Producer? Shouldn't be prosecuted as a strong case on appeal. I, I, maybe I'm missing something. Hunter's ex, London Roberts, she has said, and she also told Piers Morgan, she's the mother of the five-year-old granddaughter that she had at a wedlock with Hunter Biden. Remember how Hunter Biden treated her? Remember how Hunter Biden treated his daughter? Remember how Joe Biden treated his granddaughter? Well, guess what? Joe Biden still has never met his five-year-old granddaughter. She also told him, Piers Morgan, she considered suicide when pregnant with Hunter Biden's baby while he was in the throes of serious drug addiction. Hunter is... 54 years old. I heard somebody refer to him as a kid. He's 54 years old. New York Post. He refused initially to acknowledge the existence of Navy Joan, who was born in 2018, following a month-long affair with Robert. He's had affairs with his sister-in-law. He's had... This guy is a sleazeball. Well, Robert said Hunter and the child have been building a relationship on Zoom. No one else in the Biden family, including the president and the first lady, Jill Biden, have personally met the little girl. This is what they are. They're a fiction. They lie. We're going to welcome the little girl into our lives. They haven't even talked to her. They're not even curious about her. They could care less. She described a complicated relationship with the troubled first son and feeling hurt by a 2019 New Yorker profile in which he denied ever having sex with her. What a sleazeball. I can remember just reading it and just not having any words, she told Morgan. She admitted she had suicidal thoughts after learning she was pregnant because of all the drama surrounding her relationship with Hunter, but said she wouldn't have taken her own life until after the baby was born. She described her pregnancy as, quote, one of the loneliest times of my life as a relationship with Hunter had ended after she told him she was pregnant. Where are the women's rights groups? Oh, we support Biden. She should have just aborted her baby. That's all. It's a choice. She said, I went through some pretty dark times emotionally and mentally during that time. She said she thought about suicide. I knew that as long as I was pregnant, I wasn't going to do anything to myself because that would harm my child. So I didn't think I would do anything to myself while I was pregnant. But I would feel that after the pregnancy, would it be better for my daughter and for Hunter and everyone else if I wasn't here? Because it seemed like a scandal and a burden. That's what it felt like at times. She was placed on the Biden scoins company payroll for nine months during an affair conducted while Hunter was also in a relationship with his widowed sister-in-law, Hallie. And notice Hallie's testified against him. And this young lady, London Roberts, has testified against him. But don't worry, Joe was there until she decided to go to the D-Day ceremony. She was there staring at the jury. Oh, yeah. She wanted them to know. Notice there's no controversy about the federal judge handling this case. No complaints. She's playing it by the book. Real witnesses, real testimony, not fake witnesses with fake testimony. Notice, we know exactly what the charges are against Hunter Biden. Notice. Notice those charges have not 
expired under the statute of limitations. They're still there. Notice that? Just wanted to bring that up. And notice the jury is picked out of Wilmington. That would be like the Trump jury being chosen out of Utah. But we'll see. In his memoir, Beautiful Things, Hunter claimed he had no recollection of our encounter. Roberts admitted being fascinated when she met Hunter in 2018, although she knew he was having an affair with Hallie at the same time and struggling with a serious addiction to crack. What a guy. He had a demon on his back, she told Morgan. He was obviously suffering from addiction during that time, but he had my attention. I was intrigued. In the interview, Roberts gave Hunter credit for not suggesting she get an abortion after she told him she was pregnant. No, he just blew her off and said, I'm not giving you any money and it's not my daughter. Robert's book, Out of the Shadows, My Life Inside the Wild World of Hunter Biden, will be published in August. I'd like to interview her, Mr. Producer, if you'll reach out to that publisher, whomever it is. According to her Instagram account, she's been working at her family's gun store. (laughs) Rob Roberts Custom Gun Works in Batesville, Arkansas. Sounds like a cool store. Just make sure Hunter doesn't go in there. Oh, I didn't check the box. Ugh. I just kind of roamed into that gun shop. This is the argument. I just kind of roamed into that gun shop there. The salesman pressured me to buy a gun. This is, this is the argument Abby Lowell's come up with. Well, he's got to come up with something. It's weak. It's pathetic. This guy's guilty as hell. And today proved it. The defense was awful. But well, how could it not be? Roberts, a former college basketball star from Arkansas, said she doesn't want to see Hunter go to prison and hopes his father would pardon him if it came to that. She's hopeful that Hunter and Navy will meet in person soon. They haven't met either. He's very busy. Do I understand Hunter's married again? Oh, what a brilliant young girl to marry this guy. Navy's well aware. She knows her father is very busy right now, and he's got a lot of things going on. She's waited five years. She can wait a couple more months. Yes. And the Bidens. Joe and Jill Biden, they're so lovely and so compassionate. Look how they treat their own blood. Look how they treat their own blood. This guy, Biden, is so loathsome. What he did in his career in the Senate to prevent, he hoped, integration of our public schools, the crime bill in 1994 targeting black people using, not cocaine, crack, just like his son does now, or did. What's going on on the board? This is a heartless SOB, this guy. I'm just telling you the truth. It's not even what he says, as pathetic as that is. Look at who he is. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Did you know one of the largest U.S. flags in the state of Georgia stands proudly in Pure Talk's parking lot? To honor that flag, Pure Talk is supporting America's warrior partnership in their mission to prevent veteran suicide. For our servicemen and women, the transition to civilian life can be very difficult, especially now. Access to housing, employment, and even their earned VA benefits can be very difficult. That's where America Warriors Partnership steps in by providing real support where and when our vets need it most. And you can help this noble cause when you switch to Pure Talk's 5G service and support this great charity. Through Flag Day, they'll match every dollar donated up to $50,000. Choose a wireless company that shares your values and puts you on America's most dependable 5G network for just $20 a month. Go to puretalk.com slash Levin. That's puretalk.com slash L-E-V-I-N to make the switch. That's puretalk.com slash Levin for superior cell phone service. That's half the price of Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile. And to help Pure Talk with vets in need. Yo, yo. We're back. The Democrats are always on the march. They don't have many naysayers. They don't have people who are circumspect. No. On the Republican side, we have the can't you all get along crowd. Yes, we can. But they don't want to. And so they would prefer somebody like me as a punching bag. 
punching bag. We have to appeal to independence. And in order to appeal to independence, we have to be punching bags or be more like the Democrats. I don't know. Ronald Reagan was nothing like the Democrats. He pounded the hell out of them with a big smile on his face. And they hated his guts. And he won by a landslide. You know what the American people want? Including people who are on the fence? A leader. Somebody who's principled. Somebody who's patriotic. Who embraces our founding and our principles and our economic system. Who loves America. And that resonates. These rhinos who go on and on about moderate, center-right, and so it has nothing to do with this surface-level, superficial claptrap. People want to see strength. Not the iron fist, but strength. Clarity. Somebody who believes in the country. That's not Biden. It's Trump. I'll be right back. Here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. Let's see, should I do a nuclear story, Mr. Producer, or a fast food story? Priorities. Let's start with the nuclear, shall we? I go through hundreds and hundreds of news stories, of columns, of long essays and so forth before I whittle it down to a relative handful and I don't normally get to all of them particularly if I want to talk about something that has nothing to do with the news just so you know what I do before I come on the air I'm not a reader on the air I read things on the air But I just don't have a stack of stuff and I start picking them off and read them to you and then intersperse guests. Be the easiest damn thing in the world, but it's not what I do. And we have a Breitbart story here. UN nuclear watchdog condemns Iran for banning inspectors. Have any of you heard Joe Biden, Antony Blinken, or that creep Sullivan? Have any of you heard the three stooges of foreign policy ever condemn the Islamo-Nazi regime in Tehran for building nuclear weapons, for banning UN inspectors? Not a word. All the attacks are on Israel. Because Joe Biden, listen, Joe Biden's an anti-Semite, and expect the prebubescent, pathetic morons at Media Matters to put that in a headline. Mark Levin said Joe Biden is an anti-Semite. Because Media Matters doesn't matter anymore. They're about to go out of business. The International Atomic Energy Agency yesterday passed a resolution condemning Iran for banning nuclear inspectors and called on the Iranian government to cooperate more fully with the UN nuclear watchdog. Did you hear Joe Biden talk about that at the D-Day ceremony? He talked about Russia. Okay, I don't have a problem with that. But he leaves certain things off the table intentionally. He doesn't speak out for Israel, and he doesn't condemn Iran or the terrorist monsters that are surrounding the state of Israel. The resolution, and by the way, Reagan and Trump both referenced the Holocaust. Biden did not. I mean, World War II was a horrendous war, but... One aspect of it was the Holocaust, right? The resolution passed with a vote of 20 to 2 plus 12 abstentions. 12 abstentions. The no votes came from Iran's allies, Russia and China. This is the, the new axis lined up against the United States. 
The Biden administration tried to squelch the resolution. Got that? Because it hopes to resume nuclear deal negotiations and fears alienating Iran. But in the end, the U.S. had to vote in support of the measure. The need for the board to hold Iran accountable to its legal obligations is long overdue. Iran must urgently, fully, and unambiguously cooperate with the agency, said a joint statement from the U.K., France, and Germany, who proposed a resolution. But not the United States. The board will not sit idly by when Iran challenges the foundations of the non-proliferation system and undermines the credibility of the international safeguards regime, said the joint statement. Remember, this was the effort that Blinken, at the direction of Biden and Obama, was trying to sabotage. They were actually lobbying Britain, France, and Germany not to do this. Now, Britain, France, and Germany, under the current leadership, aren't exactly courageous. But they even say, wait a minute, we might have peace in the crap out of this regime, and now look, they're on the precipice. Biden, shh, shh, no, 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 shh, hush. Hush, hush. Go after Netanyahu. Go after the Jew over there, the prime minister. He won't, he won't do what we tell him to do. The SOB. We're trying to put lapdogs in there. Desperately. We're trying to overthrow him. We're giving advice to the Marxist radicals in Israel on how to overthrow. They're trying. Not successful yet. In fact, his poll numbers are going up. Matter of fact, Trump's poll numbers are going up, and we're trying to put him in prison. What the hell's going on here? You're a slime ball. That's what's going on. The IAEA, that's the UN, called on Iran. This is, do you understand? The UN, it's IAEA, which has been appeasing Iran for a decade. Britain, Germany, and France who were all in with Obama and were appeasing Iran. Do you understand they're standing up and saying, Iran's getting a nuke, and, and Biden and Blinken and Sullivan and the other stooges in this administration have been trying to stop them from doing that? Do you understand this? Yes, you do. This was a reference to Iran blocking about one-third of the most senior IAEA inspectors from accessing its nuclear sites in September. Boy, it only took how many months, Mr. Producer? September? It's like eight or nine months ago. Well, when you have the Biden, Blinken, Sullivan clan running interference for Iran, it takes time. This is completely uncalled for. This is completely illogical, said the IAEA Director General Rafael Grassi. Grassi visited Tehran in May with an IAEA delegation in an effort to resolve several outstanding issues, including Iran's ban on senior inspectors, its deactivation of IAEA monitoring devices at some of the nuclear facility, and its mad dash to produce highly enriched uranium. I have told you that they are going to make an announcement after the American election, ours, that they have nuclear material. Now, maybe they'll do it before, because Biden's not going to do anything either way. But they want Biden reelected. The communist Chinese want Biden reelected. Russia wants Biden reelected. They know that Biden says one thing and does another. He's holding back the Iranians, Ukrainians even. And that, thanks to Biden, you know, all kinds of oils flowing into these enemy countries uh, from Iran and so forth. By the way, I made a mistake. It wasn't Morgan State. Which college was it, Mr. Producer? Morehouse College. I apologize for that. In the first hour. Last month, a confidential IAEA report leaked to the media showed Iran had now enriched 30 times the amount of uranium specified In Obama's 2015 nuclear deal, Iran's stockpile of highly enriched uranium now stands at over 6,200 kilograms. Sounds like a lot. But Mark, we pulled out of the deal. There's a lot of answers to that, including the fact that these other countries did not. Iran was never going to follow the rules. It's a terrorist state, just like we insist that Hamas agree to our peace agreement. Excuse me, I mean Israel's. 
According to the IAEA, Iran is the only non-nuclear nation to enrich uranium to such a high level. Grassi has said Iran could build several nuclear weapons with its stash of radioactive material. And so if you're president of the United States, aren't you worried about this, Mr. Producer? Aren't you trying to figure out how to stop this? You know the Israelis want to take them out. You know if Trump were president, he'd take them out. Mr. Isolationist. You know, Trump is an isolationist. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. When he needed to put his foot down, he put his foot down, and he did more to strengthen NATO than the Bushes did, than Biden is, because he threatened them. He said, you either kick in what you're supposed to, or we're out of here. And they started kicking it in. He's the one that cut off the pipeline to Putin. Joe turned it back on. Joe turned back, turned back on the Russian oil pipeline, and he turned off our pipeline. Because Joe hates America. Another lingering item of business is the discovery of unexplained uranium particles detected at undeclared uranium nuclear sites in late 2019. Gee whiz, it sounds like they're breaking all the rules. The IAEA passed a resolution in 2022 demanding Iran cooperate more fully with inspectors and explain the mysterious uranium particles, but the Iranians have never done so. Hey, they're terrorists, you dumb bastards. So is Hamas and Hezbollah. the hell's wrong with these fools? Biden. Globalist. He's our. He's an international. He's the, he's the jerk that's going to give us World War III. China's on the move. Russia's on the move. North Korea's on the move. Iran's on the move. He puts his, thro- his foot on the throat of Ukraine. He puts his foot on the throat of the Israelis. He puts his throat on our own military, for God's sakes. And Trump, you see, is the problem. Borders wide open. Trump's the problem. Inflation. Trump had 9% inflation. He just lies. Lies. Oh, the trial man had was a state case. It was fantastic, says the conga line of liars, thugs, and fools in the Democrat media. Well, then, you know, my solution to that one, Mr. Producer, is if it's good for the goose, it's good for the Marxist. And now people are saying, even friends of mine on TV, well, you don't want to, you know, retribution's a bad, excuse me. It's not retribution, it's self-defense. You can't have the Marxist Islamists in the Democrat Party burning down our justice system, and we still pretend it exists. I'm sorry, did I say that? Yes, I did. And I want to remind you, as somebody who's actually experienced in this field, It wasn't until the Independent Counsel Act was used against Bill Clinton time and time and time again by his own attorney general, because she had to. That was the law. That finally, the Democrats, Carl Levin, who was quite loathsome, God rest his soul, and Barney Frank, also loathsome, still with us, as far as I know, that they said, this law needs to lapse. Oh, okay. Okay. When I hear people say, particularly people on our side, no, we don't want to do that, really, do we? No, no, that's not... Isn't it strange that the Democrats do it, and if you react to it, there's something wrong with you? What is this? There's only one way to stop this. It's to apply it equally. I honestly don't believe we have a prosecutor in the Republican Party with the guts to do it. Can you name one? Even when I talk about a direct path to the Supreme Court, I don't know, it may not work, whatever doesn't work. That's how our guys conduct themselves. The other side is, well, it's a colorful argument, let's give it a shot. Our side wants to know the answer from the Supreme Court in advance of filing the papers. I mean, that's the difference. You got this low-life bastard, and that's the best I can say about him, Mark Elias. Mark Elias, he's on TV. They must have kicked around his ass when he was a kid because he's one angry little putz. I think we we need to be very, very eyes wide open. Does he not know English? On MSLSD, of course. 
We now know, based on the jury verdict in New York, that Donald Trump committed a crime to win the 2016 election. Listen to this guy. It's a punk. We know, based on reporting in the January 6th commission, and you know what's come out in the public sphere in the various indictments, that Donald Trump and a number of people around him appear to have committed crimes to try to undermine the, and overturn the 2020 election. This guy's supposed to be a lawyer. So as we prepare for 2024, Donald Trump is plotting his next crime. We may not know sitting here right now what that crime will be, but we know it will involve subverting the outcome of the election. Oh, an election denier, I see. We know it will involve election interference. We know it will involve efforts to prevent the will of the voters from having its day. This is how the radical left conducts itself and always has. This is what they're doing there will be a response from Trump and his campaign if it succeeds. And the problem will be Trump, his campaign, his lawyers, and you and me. Got it? These are the election destroyers. They've been denying elections. They've been denying elections since the election of John Quincy Adams. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. President Trump on with Hannity last night. Cut 16 missed. Oh, well, before we get there. Remember Jeffrey Tubin? These people have no shame, do they? There's Jeffrey Tubin doing his thing on a Zoom call. Uh, While well, he's talking to colleagues and he's, and he's caught doing it. I mean, shouldn't he be hiding his face for the rest of his life? Shouldn't he be forced to wear, wear a burqa for the rest of the time, Mr. Producer? At least from the neck up. Um, I mean, whenever this guy is invited to a party now, they have to put in there a special notation, which is pants are required. There he's with Anderson Cooper. Anderson Cooper, whose big interview, you might recall, several years ago was with Stormy Daniels. Cut 15, go. How unusual is this for Judge Cannon to, first of all, let's talk about the, the allowing third parties in. Why are you asking a question where you already have an opinion? Just because you ask it and your voice rises at the end as if you're asking a question doesn't mean it's a question. It's a setup. But let's hear what little Jeffrey Dupin has to say. Cut 15. Go ahead. She has conducted this case is wildly, totally, crazily unusual. Thank and you. We don't need to hear any more from this pervert. As you'll hear on Saturday from Professor Calabrese. She's actually an excellent judge doing what a judge is supposed to do. They're used to a Marchand, you see. They're used to a stunless little bastard. An acting state judge. With a very thin resume. But he performs for the state. He performs for the Democrats. He performs. Should we start calling him little Jeffrey Tubin, Mr. Producer? For little Jeffrey Tubin. And so now we will attack a real judge. Them having promoted a fake judge. And I would say... To Judge Cannon, be strong. In the end, you'll win out. In the end, history will treat you the right way. Because you're doing the right thing. Because Mr. Smith went to Washington unconstitutionally. Every damn thing he's done as a result of that is unconstitutional. He's a fraud, a phony, and a freak. He's the most powerful prosecutor in the United States of America, and he was never confirmed by the Senate. I'll be right back. Don't ask him for middle ground. There is no middle ground. Talk with Mark Levin now at 877-381-3811. This was just given to me. And so I need to address this because it's bothering me a lot. Bothered to me by wifey. 
and this is from Fox. Just broke. An elderly woman from Massachusetts was recently sentenced to a prison following a 2020 pro-life demonstration at an abortion clinic. Did you know that's the one place you can't protest? Because killing babies is sacrosanct. Kingston resident Paula Paulette Harlow, 75, was handed a two-year prison sentence on May 31 over an October 2020 incident that involved her and fellow pro-life activists blocking an abortion clinic. Boy, she must have been tough, that 75-year-old, don't you think, Mr. Producer? According to the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia, this is a horrendous operation, U.S. Attorney's. Harlow and 10 other pro-life activists were charged with civil rights conspiracy and freedom of access to clinic entrances face act violations. Wow. Imagine if we could do this against the, uh, the Hitler youth that were attacking Jews. But no, the Justice Department and Biden doesn't view that as a priority. Quote, the defendants forcefully entered the clinic and set about blockading two clinic doors using their bot. They sat down on the floor. Don't you love the way these bastards write stuff? They sat down on the floor. Using their bodies, furniture, chains, and ropes, the U.S. Attorney's Office in the District of Columbia said. Once the blockade was established, they live streamed their activities. Oh, my God! For everybody to see. As the evidence at the trial showed, the defendants engaged in a conspiracy to create a blockade. You have a conspiracy to create a blockade, Mr. Producer? How come all these climate goons get away with this? At a reproductive health care clinic. Ah, that's the hook. To prevent the clinic from providing the patients from receiving reproductive health services. Why don't they just call it abortion? Why don't, reproductive health services? Every abortion is due to health? That's a lie. We know that. Blocking abortion clinics is a violation of the FACE Act, which was signed into law by President Clinton in 1994. In an interview with Fox News Digital, the 75-year-old Harlow explained that she's been on house arrest in recent weeks. She's very dangerous and expects to know soon if she needs to surrender to authorities. Harlow said the 2020 incident took place at a clinic run by Dr. Caesar Santiang a doctor who has been accused of conducting late-term abortions. He described the demonstration as peaceful. We were there to intervene, to put our lives on the line, to intervene between the death of the child and the abortionist peacefully. We were there trying to talk to the mother. They feel forced into it for whatever their circumstances are, so we need to try to surround them with love, with support. Harlow's a Catholic, and we know how the Department of Justice hates those, except for Biden, of course. She explained that she became pro-life when she saw Leonard Nelson's photograph of an 18-week-old fetus published in Life magazine in 1965. How many times have I said, if some network would run a video of a late-term abortion, this would be a 80% to 20% issue against it, as it is now, the majority of Americans oppose it. But to see it, is to be sickened by it. I saw the light when I saw the pictures in Life magazine that Nelson did. The children, they have no voice and they're hidden. That is as poor as you can get. You can't even protect your own life. We have to make them visible and make them heard. Speaking to Fox News Digital, Paulette's husband, John Harlow, said he was distraught over the legal situation. It's devastating what they're doing, the whole trial and sentence and everything. But my wife doesn't want the focus to be on her. The real outrage is the fact that children are being aborted. We're all concerned about her. I told the judge I'll go to jail for her if I could. But we're in this together. And we wish the outcome had been different. But it was what it is. Harlow, who has extensive medical issues, where his incarceration can further cause her health to decline. I'm 76. I have a lot of conditions. Incarceration could be detrimental because I won't have access to the things I have now. I won't have John who's here just helping me with everything. There's a lot to take care of. Heller also told Fox News Digital her sister Jean is in jail over the same incident. She said, I consider an incredible honor. I considered going to court an incredible honor. I was really very grateful when I came out of court because not everybody has the opportunity to do that, and it was wonderful. 
Fox News reached out to DOJ for comment, but of course they wouldn't respond. If she was 18 years old, chasing Jewish students at Columbia with a flag with a swastika on it, talking about river to the sea to exterminate the Jews. She would have been in the front door of that jail and out the back door. But the 76-year-old women and these other people, they sat down in a clinic. That's all they did. And she's going to jail for two years. For two years. Has anybody else discussed this today? No. I've been wanting to get to this because it's bigger than fast food even. New York Post, California fast food restaurants have cut 10,000 jobs thanks to the state's $20 minimum wage. So they trade group. You know, folks, this isn't brain surgery. This is ideology. This is Bernie Sanders. This is Gruesome Newsome. This is the Democrat Party. They do these fan dances where they really want you to think they're, they're looking out for you, and then they take these steps, and people suffer. California fast food restaurants, writes Ariel Zilber, have slashed nearly 10,000 jobs because of the state's new $20 minimum wage as struggling franchises cut labor costs, raise prices to survive, said a major trade group. The California Business and Industrial Alliance slammed Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom. For pushing through the law, which went into effect April 1 and was blamed for forcing one beloved taco chain to shutter 48 locate Taco Bell, I think it is, in the state last week. California businesses have been under total attack, total assault for years, said the president of the group, Tom Monzo. Just another law that puts businesses in further jeopardy. Several major chains, McDonald's, Burger King, and even low-cost favorite In-N-Out Burger jacked up prices to offset the higher pro- wages. Many had to cut employees' hours. Some have expedited a move to automation. So in the end, all these employees are hurt because of these Marxist, top-down, iron-fisted police state policies. You can only raise so much, he said, and you're seeing it. People are not going to pay $20 for a Big Mac. It's just not going to happen. Rubio's California Grill, known for its fish tacos, closed 48 of its nearly 134 locations at the end of May, the first major chain to fall victim to the new law. The San Diego-based company cited the rising cost of doing business. It's that simple. And the chain filed for bankruptcy yesterday. Another fast food chain, Foster's Freeze, I've heard of them, recently closed a location near Fresno, saying the franchise owner could no longer afford to pay his workers the upgraded salaries. Fast food restaurants already bearing the brunt of persistently high inflation. This is Binomics, which is Marxism. Let's just be honest, which is government-run economy and government-run industrial policy. This is Bernie Sanders, that Stalinist bastard. This is Bernie Sanders. Fast food restaurants already bearing the brunt of the high inflation raise prices ahead of the new law or shortly after it went into effect. Beverages at Starbucks stores in California were 50 cents more expensive after April 1. Taco Bell raised menu prices by 3%. Marcus Wahlberg, whose family runs four fat burger franchises in L.A., told Business Insider in January he's planning to raise menu prices up to 10%. In response to the new law, Chick-fil-A prices spiked 10.6%. A recent survey conducted by LendingTree found 78% of consumers now consider fast food to be a luxury purchase. Due to how expensive the meals have become, of course, they're destro- it's like they've destroyed the dollar store. You can't buy anything for a dollar anymore. There's inflation, and then the value of your dollar goes down. The price of the products go up. It's called stagflation. They won't call it what it is. Stagflation. The value of your money, whether it's a pension check, whether it's your savings, whether it's a salary, whatever it is, is going down. The price of goods and services are going up. Your ability to purchase is going down. Now the availability of products 
That's going to start to kick in. Already has. Because manufacturing has a problem. You're not buying as many of their products. But the price of their products are going up. Out of their control. Look at the fast food. The value of your dollar has gone down. The price of the fast food is going up. And so what happens? It destroys the market system. So these franchisees are going broke. They're going bankrupt. They're shutting down. So no job. Newsom has been a disaster. The massive debt in California. The reckless spending in California. Joblessness is going up in California. People are trying to get the hell out of California, particularly productive people and businesses, if they can a disaster, and yet he's quit the central, the left, the Democrat part. Oh, he's presidential, don't you know? No, I don't know. I'll be right back. Mark Levin. Let's go to Ken, Louisville, Kentucky, the great WHAS. Go. Hello, yeah. Mark. Uh, first, thank you. Thank you for playing those clips of two great presidents earlier, Ronald Reagan and uh, Donald Trump. My uh, honor, I also sure. have to strongly disagree with something you said earlier, and you said it before. Yeah. But Mark, you are exactly the right guy uh. living exactly at the right time at exactly the right place. And yeah. I think I speak for all of your callers. Uh, in expressing that sentiment. Um, well, you're a very, very nice Behind man. the microphone. That's exactly what you should be doing for all of us, and um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate what you do. You're very, very kind. That really makes my evening. Thank you, my brother. Who was the lid, Mr. Producer? Yeah. Where's Jack again? Jack in Buffalo. Give me the numbers, please. Sirius Satellite. Jack, go right ahead, please. I wanted to talk about two issues, distinct issues with the Trump. I think we only have time for one, so pick the one you really want to go for. You take the position that the Supreme Court holding in Ramos and Andres says that the jury must find the defendant guilty on all matters, correct? I never said that. Well, that's what I, you don't agree I with the focused on, Ramos that applies? <clears throat> I do agree with it, but I never said that. So why did you say I said that? Well, I I've was, had a different argument. I was told that you supported that position. What do you mean? You were told by whom? I was on with Sean Hannity last night, and he cited you for supporting the position. I never brought up the Ramos decision, but I'm glad you did, because that's not a problem, <clears throat> but it's not, it's not the best solution. The best solution is simple. You actually have to have notice on what the crime is. That never actually occurred. It can't be a a state crime when you're trying to link in a federal case when the state crime has already expired. Uh, So you have to have notice. That's pretty basic, don't you think? Okay. I do. But let me speak to that. That's number one. Number two. Hold on. I'm not done. Number two. Collateral evidence. The Supreme Court's talked about that. In fact, the highest court in New York's talked about that, haven't they? Not familiar with the doctrine of collateral evidence. Well, the doctrine of collateral evidence, you don't bring evidence into a case that has as its purpose to prejudice the jury, even though it doesn't have any, any value in terms of the case that's before you. So bringing in Stormy Daniels and all the rest of it to go on and on and on about prurient matters has absolutely nothing to do with the case. Hey, listen, that's not what I was calling for. That was not Okay, go ahead. What's your next question? But all right, so if you want to discuss, let, let me just talk about, I'll move on from Ramos, but just so you know, in 2023, the Florida legislature passed a law that said that you could have a jury verdict in the guilt phase of a death penalty case. I, I, with I an got eight that, four but verdict. the New York legislature never did, did it? No, but I'm saying that doesn't that... Okay, doesn't that, it's okay, but I'm the a, New York legislature okay. can't then violate its own processes. You He's not in Florida. I know. You brought up the issue of notice. Call me tomorrow. I'm running out of time here. I'd love to have this debate. 
Mr. Producer, get his number. I'm serious. We're going to call call Jack back. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm out of time. I want to salute all of you. God bless you. Thank you. And I'll see you tomorrow.